Mark, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and I'm glad you're in good spirits. It's been a while. Um, and we are, we are opening with the, uh, the Ennio Morricone music from Once Upon a Time in the West because that was the all-time greatest film score in the opinion of our dear colleague who is deceased as of yesterday, Richard Schickel. As opposed uh, to tomorrow when he may come yes, back. That's right. Well, he might. He might. <laughs> he's just we, angry enough. He's <laughs> just angry enough. Uh, yeah. Yesterday, uh, Tim and I were on stage over at the uh, Ace Theater downtown. You ever been there, the old United Artists Theater on you Broadway? You know, I have not because I've lived in L.A. for decades, but yet I've been to maybe six things in Los Angeles. This, that theater opened uh, the day after Christmas, 1927, with a Mary Pickford movie. It was it was built by Mary Pickford and, and uh, Douglas Fairbanks. Uh, as part of United Artists, United Artists Theater downtown on Broadway, part of the Ace Hotel now, right next door to it. And uh, so anyway, we, we had, I've never been there before. So we did our, our first, it's the, our first ever Film Week Oscar show at that theater, and uh, it was great. It was terrific. I, I held down the fort for La La Land. I really did. Now there's, there's Amy, sort of, Amy truly does not like La La Land. There is an anti La La Land thing going on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's too but, late. It's too late. It's, it's not going to happen. Late, but, but there is an anti La La well, because thing. because it's become so popular that there's the contrarian thing. Look, it, it's like it was with Titanic, right? I remember that. I even said that on the stage. It's like, look, I get it. I get you, you anti La La Land people. I I hated Titanic too when it became so popular. I was throwing tomatoes at anybody who even said the word to me. So fine, I get it. I I'm I'm there, but but you know. Anyway, um, uh, but yeah, here we were on stage doing that thing, and uh, it was literally like in the car on the way back. Um, you know, afterwards there was a there was a little shindig with the uh, you know, and we and, and then we went and picked up dinner and got home, and I flipped my phone open, and Richard Schickel had died. It's like it's kind of a downer a week before the Academy Awards to to find that out. So it is true. Now Schickel was one of the not, thing is that people remember Schickel as the Time Magazine film critic, but he yeah. also did like thirty documentaries. Thirty seven, thirty seven. He made thirty or no, it's thirty seven books. Anyway, he he directed so many film history documentaries, and he wrote just a ridiculous number of film history books. Um, you know, he knew everything about movie history. He really did. He's he's, he's Malton esque in that way. And if you were ever in the room, as we were on occasion, when Leonard Malton and Richard Schickel would sort of greet each other, it was, it, was like, it was like a summit between two great world leaders. You know, those guys could talk forever about movies I've never seen. What's funny is that, is that Leonard just, is such the mainstream guy, yeah. and Schickel is, was more of the art guy. Well, Leonard walks into a room, and it's as though Jesus has just walked in. You know, uh, Schickel walks in, and it is like, it's like, you know, Caligula. Well, it, 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 I'm I'm gonna say it. He lights it up. I, I'm I'm gonna say it. Yeah. Schickel was two things. Yes. One, a great great writer and documentarian, writer. Yeah. and an ornery bastard. <laughs> <laughs> he was both. He was. And and people would look forward to the ornery bastard <laughs> things that he would say. It was I pulled up that email when we were years ago when we were <laughs> discussing um, LAFCA membership for new applicants. And David Poland, who's a blogger, had applied that year. And there was some question as to, you know, well, is David really a, a film critic or is he just a blogger? I mean, is it, does he do film criticism or is it, you know, there, there was a real discussion. And Ray had weighed in uh, on David's behalf because Ray's a good friend of <laughs> David's. And then that email came in <laughs> from Richard Schickel. And as soon as I saw that email address, I was like, oh, please, dear God. And you open it, and you just can't wait to see what it says. Because Schickel never sort of sends out a casual email that says, yeah, me too. That never, no. There's always something. And it starts off, who the hell is David Poland, and why should I care about his Lafka status? And it was just, <laughs> I sat there in tears, and I was just laughing so hard. No, 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 no. Here, I have one for you. I know you do. So... Uh, when I first joined the group, I yeah. was responsible for revamping Lafka's website. Yeah. And one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to have a questionnaire. Every critic would fill yeah. out this questionnaire, and then whenever <laughs> you visited the site, it would, it would just auto-rotate to a different question yeah. from a different critic's questionnaire. So my job was to email this questionnaire out to the 45 members of the group and get them all to respond so I would complain. You know, I would follow up with X number of critics who had yet to submit yeah, their questionnaire. I remember. So finally, one of the last ones to not submit was, was, was Schickel. Yeah. So I email everybody who had yet to submit, and then Richard sends me an email, <laughs> and the email says, Dear Mark, I cannot imagine spending a day filling out this questionnaire. Life is too short. <laughs> Best, Richard Schickel. 
And that was Richard Schickel. Oh, gosh. So, I, 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 I will miss him. Uh, he, was, he did not. I, I saw him at a couple screenings in the last uh, six to eight months. He looked yeah, terrible. Yeah. I mean, he, well, you know, it, it, the one thing you knew about Richard Schickel was that he, uh, he could not wait to get out of a film to, to light up a cigarette. He was uh, a smoker his whole life and uh, was not, you, you didn't, you, he was never the portrait of health. And um, most <laughs> film critics aren't, frankly. Uh, it makes me want to go out for a run. Tim and I talk about that. You know, you gotta, gotta, gotta defeat the the the, uh, the ass seat complex at some point. But um, you know, so Richard, uh, he made it to eighty four, and that's quite a good run, frankly, for a, a great guy. Run, sure, yeah. for somebody who smoked his whole life. Yeah, it is. So yeah, we will. You know, it's funny. I grew up reading his stuff, and I was always it was a very love hate relationship. You're like, oh damn you, oh thank God. And you, but but then you know um, when when he when we became Lafka colleagues, you you gain an insight and you realize the reason I had that love hate relationship was because his his opinions were so damn well argued. You yeah, know, he was very passionate about film. It's what it, it's it's it, a, a, a review that you hate to love or love to hate. Um, is a well-written review either way. Oh, sure. And it's well-argued, and that's why you have such a passionate opinion, because the author has made the case so persuasively, and you either agree with it or you hate yourself for, for agreeing with it, or you, you get angry because you disagree with it, and it's so well-reasoned. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I've said this many times. I don't read critics because I agree with them. I read them because I like their writing. Yeah. So Richard Schickel, a great writer, great documentarian, great author, and an ornery bastard. Very true. So, Mark, tell us you you've been you've been gone for a little bit. Oh wait, do you want some banana bread? I made some banana. Oh, bread. Oh yeah, by all means, I've missed your baking. I made hit I made me with some the, banana hit, bread. Hit me with the banana bread. With, with the what? The banana bread. I don't know what you're talking about. It's baby talk. I was in Paris last month. I saw the Great Wall before anybody. I yeah, saw the Great I, Wall before anybody. And and you know what? You may actually wind up being the only person who saw it. <laughs> it's, it's it's not good. Um, oh, and I saw Logan. Yeah, how's that? I, I missed the screening. It's good. Yeah, it's, it's R-rated. Yeah, you know, this, thing is, this thing is brutally violent, <laughs> not cartoon violent. Like, yeah. literally, yeah. you know, Wolverine will put his fist up to a person's head and extend his claws through his skull. He does that, like, like ten that. times. I like that. And, and like, <laughs> I like that. The first word of dialogue is the, is, is, is the F word. Yeah. So, and, you know, the, the, there are moments when you're like, okay, I love the fact that it's this kind of movie. You know, we need this kind of superhero movie. You know, because Deadpool did that yeah. in a comedic way. Yeah. Even the even the violence in Deadpool is a little cartoonish. This yeah. one does it in a very, you know, Clint Eastwood neo western kind of way. And some of it is a little, it's a it's a little too derivative. Like there's yeah. a scene in the movie where Charles Xavier sits in a hotel room and watches Shane. Right. As if to say, you know, okay, this is what we are yeah. doing Shane now. <laughs> you know, this is what it is. And now yeah. we're doing a family on the run movie. And now we're doing a protect the, pr- protect the kid movie like, yeah. uh, like Leon or Terminator 2 yeah. or Aliens or all the other ones. So I'm not saying it's not derivative in its bones. But the thing is that it was, it, it was a superhero movie that I wanted to see. It was good. That's awesome. It was, actually go. the, it was actually it was like, it was like the least superhero Oh, superhero film. So it redeems the uh, the Wolverine movie, which was just... You know, I, I, I said this in my review, which I haven't filed yet, but uh, I, th- I think Fox has done right by that series. You know? oh, I do, too. Uh, I mean, there, there have been some some clunkers, you know, like the like X-Men 3. And... Well, the, the, well, well, that's Brett I mean, Ratner. Okay, Brett Ratner equals I mean, clunker. But, yes, but when I, there's I'm nine saying... of anything, there's going to be a clunker. Yeah. Well, uh, on balance, I think the X-Men films have been handled very well. The one thing that I am sad about is that they started off... You know, the first Wolverine film was supposed to be the first of a number of X-Men Origins spinoffs. And there haven't been, there have been no others. They've been afraid to do it. They haven't been able to get the others out of the gate. That, I think, is unfortunate, because I think you could do a great deal with some of those other characters. It's funny, because you, you, you look at the X-Men, you think, what other characters would make a decent film? And then you look at what Marvel's doing with secondary characters like Iron Man oh, and Captain America. Ant-Man. And Ant-Man, and they make Kidding me? completely fine movies out no, of them. No, absolutely. It's not, it's, not, it's not a question of, oh boy, this is such a minor character. No, you can, you can, great story is a great story. Whether it's built around Ant-Man or Superman, it doesn't matter. You know? And a bad story is a bad story. So, uh, you know, Ant-Man is a better movie than Man of Steel. Is Ant Man a more interesting hero than Superman? No, <laughs> but it's a better movie. movie. By the way, uh, I I I have twenty American dollars. 
ready to throw down on the table. Well, I bet with you. Oh dear. The bet is. Yeah. What are the chances? No, here's the bet. Yeah. Will Ben Affleck's Batman ever get made in any form? It'll get made. Uh, the question is obviously whether Matt will be the director. I, you know, I sent it, I sent him a I sent him a text actually the uh, <laughs> after I heard the announcement, and and I said if uh, if you don't put Adam West in a cameo, I'm never I'm never talking to you again. Uh, Did he text you back? <laughs> no, he didn't. He texted Mark Sanderson back, uh, but they had a serious conversation. My text was not meant to be answered. Uh, it's a joke. But, um, you know, let's, let's remember this. They, they lost their first Flash director. They lost their first Wonder Woman director. They've lost their first Batman director already with Ben Affleck. They've rewritten these things endlessly. They keep pushing dates. They've, they've slipped Aquaman, what, two or three times? Uh, it, I, I'm sorry, but the whole DC thing is really a train wreck right now. There's no one minding the store, and they are trying. They're still trying to get their footing on what they want this whole thing to be. At a point when it should already be that the Justice League is now, you know, underway. Man, that's you can't change that. You can't now. You can't midstream go. You know what? Let's recast uh, Aquaman, or well, let's let uh, let's let's figure out how we're going to do Cyborg. No, n- now they're committed. I mean, they committed when they made Man of Steel and then pushed it into Batman versus Superman, and now, now they're committed. I mean, it, it's a mess. I think it's a real mess because they they need some they need a creative type. Matt to... is the is the right director. Matt should have been the the Man of Steel guy. He was allegedly the runner up to 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 Zack Snyder, which I think was you know in, inconceivable. And if Matt had been that guy, it would have been – they'd be on good footing because Matt's a story guy. But Spider's thi- not. And the thing with Ben Affleck, the only thing – and I, I never thought I would say this about Ben Affleck – is that if he was the guy to oversee – Yeah. Look, the guy who directed an Oscar-winning Best Picture and has directed you know, nothing but good films, Live by Night notwithstanding, yeah. you could give him – you could make him the, the, the minder of the he, store. He, and I would trust him more than Zack Snyder. He did not feel he could be Batman in the costume and direct the movie at the same time. And I would, I, I, I think that was a mature decision for him to make. It's one thing when you are Mel Brooks directing yourself, and you go up there and go, and then you run behind the camera, and okay, I like, you know, fair enough. But in, in those heavy special effects movies where, for much of the movie, he's going to be wearing the cowl and a costume and a cape and armor and all that stuff, to, to then at the same time be the guy who directs the movie, that's too much. It's too much. It's not. It's not really feasible. And I think, it, to his credit, he realized at a certain point this was just not going to work. It's not going to work. You're going to be shooting like an eighth of a page a day. You know what does work though? Huh. Banana bread. Hit me. Get the banana bread. Because we've been doing this for 20 minutes, we have not talked about one DVD or Blu-ray. Well, we're let, go do it, and I'm going to hit some anime because we're still backlogged on anime. But my goodness, there's some really, really good stuff here. Um, uh, Hakuoki, Demon. Of the Fleeting Blossom, Record of the Jade Blood. That is an awesome title. Nobody knows what it means, but it's such a perfect anime title. Hakuoki, Demon of the Fleeting Blossom, Record of the Jade Blood. Don't worry about what it means. Here's all you got to know. Uh, this is absolutely incredible animation. Absolutely amazing animation. Now, this is the second season of this show. If you haven't seen the first season, you're, you're going to have no idea what's going on. Uh, I had to go back and take a look at a few of the first season stuff. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really, really cool. It's, uh, it's, it's phenomenal animation. Uh, some of the best that I've, I think I've ever seen on an anime television series. And, uh, you know, it's, it's basically medieval Japanese stuff, uh, samurai era, shogun era uh, intrigue, but it's just so beautifully drawn and so beautifully conceived. And uh, the whole soap opera of, uh, you know, this, uh, the, 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 you know, the, 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 uh, the various warring figures and who's going to betray whom and guard whom and protect whom and uh, it... It gets a little bit hard to uh, a little bit hard to follow sometimes, but if you've seen the first season, you'll follow it. Okay, it, it is a soap opera and it's great. Hakuoki, Demon of the Fleeting Blossom, Record of the Jade Blood, season two. Uh, we also have Wakaba Girl, the complete collection. Uh, the uh, you know this is this is an, a, a part of anime I, I always kind of just don't really get. It's it's teenage girls and. Uh, what goes on in school, and it's, I guess this is the, uh, the John Hughes version of 
of whatever goes on in uh, in anime. Anyway, big eyes, big heads, long hair, uh, sometimes short hair, really short skirts. I don't know. You can't have long hair or shorts. And and uh, you either have a long hair and a long shirt a skirt or a short hair and a short skirt. That's how these things seem to be. Banana bread. I made it just for you. That's a lie. Fantastic. That's a lie. Yeah, but, you know, I'll pretend that it's true. Um, I'll finish the anime later. Hit, hit us with the music. <laughs> you are so into banana bread. Oh, yeah. Is that good? Mmm. Very good. Now, you, you, would tell, you would tell me if it's bad, right? Oh, yeah, I would. Well, it's you know marbled. what? I feel I didn't marble it enough. You see that big... How was France, by the way? You've huh? been, you been in France, and then France came here. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. It's great. Huh? I was in France for, uh, for a week. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, long story, I, I have a girlfriend who lives in Paris. She actually lives about five miles south of Paris, but it's a 10-minute uh, uh, metro ride into the heart of the city. So she's basically in Paris. You overlapped in Paris with my wife by, like, 12 hours. There was no way we were going to see no each way. other. It was not no. going to happen. Because the thing is that I... You know, because we have a long-distance relationship, this is a long story. I met her at the Cannes Film Festival in 2004, so this is a very long odyssey. But um, uh, because we have a long-distance relationship and we only see each other once every couple of months, we try to live as boring as we can. I don't go, I don't go to Paris and, and trip the night fantastic because I need to be with her in a completely mundane, quotidian way. So I went, to, uh, I went to visit her and had a great time. I wound up seeing The Great Wall about a month before it came out in the States. So I knew earlier than most how bad it was. And uh, I had a great time. Had a great time, ate a lot of great food, uh, hung out with, she's got a four-year-old daughter. And uh, we had a great time because I'm just a big, I'm just a big clown. And uh, kids love me and uh, had a great time. And then she was here. She was here and we had a crepe party, which you missed. I know. Because I've got a four-year-old. She brought her crepe pan from Paris. She bought a crepe pan, stuffed it in her luggage, and brought it to Paris. And uh, we had about ten friends over, and uh, she made crepes. She made crepes. She put out all the fixins in the middle of the dining room table, and she taught everybody how to make a French crepe. And uh, it was very exciting. That's awesome. Yes, it is. You know what else is awesome? Arcade Fire. Yeah. Arcade Fire, uh, they have a new... um, a new uh, Blu-ray called The Reflector Tapes. This is uh, live at Earl's Court. It's a film by uh, Khalil Joseph, who's very talented. This thing looks great. It sounds great. Uh, it's got a whole lot of songs on it, it's a lot of them from their um, uh, from the, Re- the Reflector Tapes. But also they do play some older stuff, which is great. They played Rebel- I, Rebellion Lies is one of the songs that actually kind of got me into them. So I would definitely recommend Arcade Fire, the Reflector Tapes, good stuff there. Gimme Danger is a great film about the Stooges. Uh, this is directed by Jim Jarmusch, who obviously is the same Jim Jarmusch who gave us a Patterson this year and uh, all sorts of great films, Ghost Dog and Lo- uh, Lovers Left Alive. This is all about the Stooges, and uh, Iggy Pop is the most famous member of the Stooges, and he is... Uh, represented here plenty, and it's all about the band, where they started, how they got started, why they became popular, the type of music they made, and it's uh, great. Lots of anecdotes, lots of music, good stuff, give me danger if you like that kind of music. Uh, Leonard Cohen passed away uh, a little while ago, and uh, this is a a film by Leon Lunson called Leonard Cohen, I'm Your Man. So this is, uh, it's a look back at Leonard Cohen it's a portrait of a guy who, to me, I didn't even know who this guy was until he was 60 years old. I didn't realize I that he had this huge decades-long career since he was like a, a, a young adult. I found the same thing out, too. When he, when he, yeah, I, it, it, you just, whatever. And he was, Things and, that slip you by. And if, if you think Morrissey is depressing, you got to listen to Leonard Cohen. This guy is like the king of mope. But he's brilliant, and he has an amazing catalog of, 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 of songs. Some of them are performed here on I'm Your Man by U2, Rufus Wainwright, uh, Nick Cage. And so it's good. Leonard Cohen, I'm Your Man, a great tribute to a great artist who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, Danny says is a uh, – I kind of just skimmed through this. But it's about a guy named Danny Fields, and he was a guy who worked with The Doors and Lou Reed and Judy Collins. And he managed a lot of artists, including the Stooges, who we just talked about. So – Danny Fields is one of those guys who you don't know who he is when you put the DVD in, and then you learn about him. You know, he was a Harvard dropout, and he worked with Andy Warhol, 
and he did publicity, and he winds up dealing with all these great musical artists of that era. And so here's a guy who, you know what, didn't know who he was when I started to watch it, skimmed through it, and I realized this guy was pretty important. So Danny says an interesting look at a, an unsung hero of the uh, music of the 60s and 70s. Um, I'm going to leave these to Wade because Wade loves crap like this, and I couldn't care less. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to say anything about Bruckner's Sixth Symphony. I'm just not. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend I watched it. So uh, we get we get imports every once in a while from the Legendary Treasures line, uh, which Naxos releases, and uh, this is the Sviatoslav Richter Archives, Volume Twenty One. Got to be honest, it's really really crappy video. Um, but if you if you want to see uh, a couple of you know some legendary musicians do some great classical music, uh, it's it's kind of a nice you know throwback. Um, Thing. I mean, a lot of this video just it just sits there, you know, rotting. Uh, this is from 1981. Um, television in Russia in the 1980s is kind of like television in the United States in the 1940s. It looks terrible. But anyway, horrible, horrible source material. But it's still fine. You, you know, Oleg Kagan on uh, viol, uh, violin and Galina Pizarenko uh, soprano. They play some Metner music. I'd never heard of Metner either. Uh, sonata, piano sonata, romances and songs. That's fine. Uh, you know, it's, if, if, if that's your thing, that's your thing. Uh, this is great. Handel's uh, Alcina Tamerlano. Uh, this is a, uh, a couple of Handel operas from Les Talents Lyriques. This is uh, really a very, very nice set. Uh, this is from Out There or Out Here. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I'm not sure if the T is replicated in there. But this is uh, O U T H E R E. That's the uh, the music line. This is also imported uh, from uh, by Naxos. Uh, you get to Alcina on uh, the first Blu-ray and Tamerlano on the second Blu-ray. It's a really really beautiful set. Nice import. And uh, Rossini's Armida, another great opera, also on Blu-ray. Uh, this is from the um, Antwerp Orchestra and Chorus, and uh, very very nicely done. Uh, I'm I'm. You know, Rossini, I, I know like five pieces of. I'm not familiar with Armida, but if you're an opera fan, you'll love it. And Bruckner, Symphony Number no. 6. Uh, Bruckner is almost as bombastic as uh, Mahler. Uh, these are all guys that were competing with uh, Beethoven to just be really just loud and romantic. Uh, I like Bruckner. And this is from the Bruckner Symphony series with Christian Thielemann of the Staatskapelle Dresden. Oh, uh, I love those guys. I, He's a I, great conductor, man. Seriously, I, I, I know you're. I know you're mocking, but he is. I a, have he them is on my great, retis- I have them on my fantasy team. I'm sure you do. He is a great conductor. That'd be a great my idea. Opera Fa- fantasy team. Fa- opera fantasy. Fa- this is you know fantasy symphony. That'd be great. So wait, anyway. d- wait. I can't talk now. I'm studying for my opera fantasy of team draft. So uh, getting back just for a moment to some uh, anime. Uh, burn through a little bit of this. Uh, got a couple of Gundam sets here. Uh, you know, it, it's it's off. There's so many different Gundam lines. It's hard to sort of keep track of all the storylines and what's where and who's who and so forth. Uh, this is Gundam Rokongista or Rokongista in G. So here's the deal. Wait, what? Nobody cares about any of this. Gundam. No, there's not this a person is cool. no, listening this is cool. to this podcast who gives two craps about they what you it. said in the there's last space, three minutes. It's got a space elevator. Got a space elevator. Come on, give it up for the space elevator. Mm-hmm. Uh, but do they have a great space coaster? Ultimately, look, here's the deal with all the Gundam things. You, you just want somebody to throw on the Gundam suit and to... Uh, oh, I'm know. sorry. I thought you were still talking about opera. No. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, anyway, so there, there's a space elevator. It connects the Earth to space. And uh, you know, eventually people put the, you know, the Gundam suit on and they start fighting. And then who really cares what the plot is at that point? Uh, but it, uh, it, it, it does get into a kind of interesting area, you know, space piracy and... There's some cool stories to it. Ultimately, it's all about the suit. Those, those suits are just the best. Uh, so that is um, uh, Gundam Rekongista in G from, uh, from the Sunrise line of Right Stuff. And then we've also got uh, Gundam Mobile Suit V Collection 1, also from Sunrise. And this is a little bit, uh, I think this takes place chronologically before the other one. I, again, I always kind of struggle to figure out how all these things plug into each other. There's just so much Gundam out there. Uh, uh, slightly less exhilaratingly animated, but um, but still actually a lot of fun. Just because you you know this is this is this part of the Universal Century uh, year 153, and I think the Gundam Reconquista is the end of the Universal Century and the beginning of a new one. I think that's how it all plugs together. But in any case, uh, you know you're you're 
space empires and um, warring tribes and, you know, everything kind of uh, Earth hangs in the balance as it always does. And you got uh, 26 episodes of this thing, which is, uh, you know... Pretty pretty great stuff if you can kind of follow what's going on. I always in I, I always enjoy uh, a, a good Gundam even if I don't know what's going on. And then um, last two here that I'll make uh, for this show is uh, from Nickelodeon: Legend of Korra, the complete series. This is one of the more popular anime shows that has wound up on American television. Nickelodeon uh, hosted it, and it's uh, five hours worth of bonus features in addition to the complete series. Uh, which is pretty great. And uh, this is Blu-ray. It is uh, really, really cool, really well animated. Uh, the, um, the This is the sort of the original animated Avatar world, the last airbender ongoing, and uh, not to be confused with the James Cameron movie. But it's, uh, you know, it's kind of Middle-earth-ish. It's very... Uh, it's very fantasy-like. It's a little bit like an Asian Lord of the Rings deal, if, you, if you're not familiar with the world. And uh, that's a beautiful set. And then also from Viz is uh, Bleach, set two. I continue to be sort of dumbfounded by the, um, by the storyline here. It gets very, very apocalyptic and mythical, and uh, it's often hard to follow, as much anime is. I say that on this show a lot, but uh, still really, really beautifully animated. Set two for Bleach. Um, go on. Hang, hang with the Soul Society. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, and that will lead us into this. Mark. Yes? How do you feel about Beavis and Butthead, the complete collection? <laughs> Including Beavis and Butthead to America. Uh, uh, my problem is it's not on Blu-ray. It's only DVD. You, you could give me this if you wanted to. I am not happy that it's not on Blu-ray. You could give me this if you wanted to. I want it on Blu-ray. Oh, that means that you can give me this and wait for it on Blu-ray. I, uh, well, look, here's the thing. The Beavis and Butthead Volume 4 uh, came out on Blu-ray in 2012. Uh... I, w- I have been expecting, you know, some kind of Beavis and Butthead complete thing on Blu-ray for the longest time. We're not getting it. I want to know what the problem is. What's the problem? Why isn't it out there? Why the don't problem we have is it? as you're waiting, they're waiting for you to give me this version, and then yeah. you can wait for the Blu-ray. Well, anyway, the, the, this is basically the same thing that came out with the the Mike Judge collection back in uh, 2006. So I, I I guess they're just putting it out there again. But I'm. I am. Uh, I just don't understand. I want. I want a complete collection on Blu-ray. Why will they not do the Blu-ray? Why will they not do the Blu-ray? Because I don't, uh, I don't know why. <sighs> anyway, you know what? Because they look at the profit and loss. They look at the P and L. Doesn't make sense. How much is going to cost to master it in Blu-ray versus how much they expect to make let's, on it? Let's let's talk for just a moment. Beavis and Butthead. Why do we love them so much? Because, because they are just. First of all, they remind us of ourselves. Back when we were that age, or at least people—that's <laughs> sadly true. Or at least people we knew. Yeah. Also, there is just something so just elemental about it. There's just something about a guy who just laughs in a way that will always make me laugh. That's unfortunately true. But really, it, honestly, I I love that show because I I was not that guy, but I recognized that guy and I knew that guy. Yeah. And it just in it, it, with, with a minimal amount of dialogue. It just really nailed who that guy is. And plus, there, there's something about the amount of comedy they're able to get out of so little dialogue. It's, it, it, I it's mean, the, the, the guy just goes, <laughs> and I can't stop laughing. How many of us have, have, have actually, as grown men, in, invoked phrases like, um, I am Cornholio, I need teepee for my bunghole? See, I never said I, that. You didn't, really? No, I didn't. That was a little too, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not doing teepee for my, I, I, when I was that age, <laughs> I, I didn't do teepee for my bunghole jokes. I just didn't. But as an adult, you do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so really quickly, uh, segueing from animation into live action anime, uh, anime which has been adapted into live action stuff, uh, Funimation has given us uh, a number of really, really awesome, uh, awesome tidbits here. Attack on Titan, the movie, part two. Live action Attack on Titan. If you're a fan of Attack on Titan uh, in animated form, you will love this. Uh, Japan has a very specific, the Japanese industry has a very, very specific way of uh, translating a lot of their um, their anime uh, classics into live action movies, it doesn't always work. The Space Cruiser Yamato uh, uh, sp- or Space Battleship Yamato uh, live action not quite so great. Uh, I had waited a long time for that, but 
it it's nice to see the things kind of be made flesh and blood and the and the and the CGI and the effects are oftentimes really really sharp. So they all kind of follow in the vein of that. A- Attack on Titan part 1 and now the movie part 2 uh is is actually quite a lot of fun. It's really well done. It's super high uh in graphic CGI, really really intense, but uh you know, they do a really good job. And uh even more impressive, I got to say are all three parts of the Roroni Kenshin uh uh, series is part one, part two, and part three. Part one is Origins, part two is Kyoto Inferno, and part three is uh, The Legend Ends. And it's just violent and bloody, and uh, actually probably even better than it ever was on anime. It is just beautifully, beautifully done. So, um, you know, this basically deals with uh, medieval Japan and uh, samurai assassins and. It's just, it's you know, it's not Kurosawa. It's much pulpier and comicier, and it's obviously a, it, it it lends a, it owes a lot to its anime origins. But really, really outstanding. All of these are Blu-ray and DVD combo sets with ultraviolet, so you can get it on your ultraviolet library, like I have, and you can show it to your three-year-old toddler or your four-year-old toddler, and uh, and terrorize uh, him or her with uh, images of uh, Japanese actors beheading each other and decapitating and slashing limbs off, and it's good stuff. Do, do people still care about uh, Ultraviolet? I do. Boy, yeah. do I ever. So, Mark, before we get into new movies, yeah. uh, we're, we're going to throw, uh, throw a shout-out to our good friend Axel Peronio. Long-time listener, Axel. Axel's doing a good thing. You know that? You're about to tell me if I don't. I am. You haven't read any of the emails because you've been yes, cavorting. Have. have you? Sort of. Maybe. So, Axel uh, lives in Luxembourg, and you know because we've got listeners all over the globe. And he is starting a uh, a cine club, a movie oh, club. Oh, I read about that. Yeah, I love and, it. And uh, he's really, really he's putting a lot of work into this thing, and it is really, really impressive. It's a it's a completely curated video club, and uh, he's he is going to he is going to carry the water for everyone who really believes that movies matter. And uh, we give this club our full endorsement. I think it's great. I think it is. Uh, it, it is. Uh, I think the idea of uh, having people in professional organizations. I, I think the idea of creating movie clubs out of the chaos of a corporate environment is one of the greatest things I, I, I've ever heard. Because you have people of all kinds of backgrounds and disparate interests who now can bring all of that together in this age where people are retreating more and more into their living rooms. And you're you're sort of reintroducing the idea of movies as a social experience again in sort of the ultimate social environment and the one that is sort of detouring people more than ever from doing social things uh, because people work so much they don't have time to do social things. So now Axel is is taking the torch and he's saying why not take advantage of the social environment of, of work and encourage people to uh, re-embrace the social aspects of movies. I think it's great. Axel, we salute you. Uh, we lend you our full support. Any help we can offer in this respect to you and your colleagues, we fully uh, are prepared to do. So um, run with it. I think it's a great idea. Agreed. And you know that Axel's not going to not going to have his friends and and fellow movie lovers come over and watch Captain no. America: Civil War. No. <laughs> they're <laughs> well, they're going to watch an actual movie they, that will get people loving real movies again. Yes, they are. They're going to watch Doctor Strange. Yes, yeah, they are. Why okay. was he your favorite superhero? That made no sense to me. Well, when, we'll discuss it when we cover the movie. What? Which will probably be next week. Oh. Because it came. Wait, uh, why is Tom Ford a movie director? How'd that happen? Because he wanted to be. <laughs> why was Howard Hughes a movie director? Because yeah. he wanted to be. Well, he, well Howard when had you, all the money in the world. He could do whatever he wanted. Well, so does Tom Ford. I guess. Good grief. Tom Ford's wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. So Tom Ford has directed two films. Um, the they're sec- both good. Yeah, they're both really good. Uh, Nocturnal Animals, directed by Tom Ford. He also wrote it. And you, you cannot fault this guy for his ambition. No. Because this it's thing terrific. tells two stories that he tell, the stories are separate, but they are intertwined, right? Well, let's put Amy Adams, who is in, inexplicably not nominated for an Academy Award. And I brought this up yesterday, and let me just say this, because we're going to talk about Arrival as well, uh, which also comes out this week. Amy Adams was in two very good, very successful movies this season, Right. Fair enough. Nocturnal Animals and the Arrival, or and, and Arrival. Arrival is the only one of the nine nominated Best Pictures that has zero nominations for actors. It's the only one. The other, the other eight are all nominated in the acting categories. Arrival's the only one that's not. It 
And yet, in the best actress category, I mean, the it's the it, there's no the, the only person there is Emma Stone who is nominated for an appearance in a uh, a performance in a best a best picture in La La Land. Four of the best actors best, in best pictures. Four of the best of the supporting um, uh, actors and actress uh, for the supporting actors in best pictures. All five supporting actresses in best pictures. Of the actresses, only one. So why is Amy Adams in there? What's the deal? I don't, I don't get it. I, my, my, my Numerically, s- I can't wrap my head around it. I, I just wonder whether whether Arrival, where the the Academy thought Arrival was more an achievement of direction, and people love him. They love Denis Villeneuve. Yeah, right. I guess. They love him, and yeah. I love him. And if anybody's got to do Blade Runner, if that if that movie has to be made, yeah, he's the guy. I'm glad it's he's him. the man. But in the meantime, we have well. Nocturnal Animals, and this thing is just gripping. Tom Fort hits out of the park. It's 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 got a noir thing going on. It's it's very violent. It's very emotional. It leaves you with a lot of questions. You're a little bit haunted by it. It's a tricky narrative juggling act, and he just he just really makes it happen. And you know, people complain that this film was very surface level and very slick, but that's who these people are. Yeah, you know, so that makes sense. He's uh, visually the film mirrors the characters. Yeah, you know. This is very pretty, very glossy, a lot of sheen. You know, and I, I, Michael Shannon, who's just everybody's, everybody's favorite. I love him. We all love him. Yeah. Oscar nomination. And, uh, yeah, I love this film. It's a great film. I'm very surprised. Tom Ford, keep making movies. Yes, I agree. I think it's, uh, you know, a lot of people have said, what a horrible movie. It's about all this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Nothing really awful happens in this movie. She's reading a book. And it is a, it, this is a movie about psychological revenge and abuse. It is, it is fascinating when you step back and you realize what it is you're watching and how it affects you. Ford is a very skilled filmmaker. I mean, he puts movies together like, like a fine suit. <laughs> you know how long I thought up that one? Uh, you know, I, 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 hope, I hope no more than about seven seconds. Probably six. Okay, so uh, The Arrival, the other Amy Adams movie. Uh, we got this in 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray and digital HD copy, which means ultraviolet. Uh, and yes, it is staggering in 4K. I, if there's a movie that needs to be in 4K, this is this is the one. My goodness, you you see every little suctiony tentacle of every CGI effort in this thing when those those little like starfish hand things of theirs go shwink onto the glass. <laughs> It's it's pretty impressive. It really is. Um, of of all of the first contact movies, and there's a few of them. You know, it all start sort of starts with close and I guess it starts with 2001, really. Uh, if we're if we're honest, so the genre starts with 2001. It segues into Close Encounters. We of course have Contact. You know, there've been a few of these. Um, Star Trek First Contact. Yeah, not really. What the that's uh, that's a Star Trek movie. Uh, this is right up there. It's not Close Encounters. It's not 2001, but I think I like this better than Contact, and I like Contact a lot. I think I like this better than Contact too. You know, I I, I like the fact that it it it's trying to posit a very sophisticated idea. Yeah, incredibly so. Right in a mainstream science fiction film. Yeah. I mean, you've got to sit at the end of the scene. You got to think. Wait a second. What is this movie telling me about the nature of time? The nature of time and the nature of, of love and life and humanity. It, 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 it really goes into some pretty deep places and in a beautiful way. Um, because ultimately, if you think about it, at the end of this movie, you know, m- usually movies that deal with, with alien contact, there's some kind of a conflict going on. That's the nice thing about first contact movies is that they don't they're, – there are no evil aliens. They're, they're more about understanding, more about sort of the, uh, the, the detente of trying to – somehow bridge all of the things that separate us and language and species and air and who knows whatever else, you know, what is out there and what prevents us from perhaps coexisting. It's pretty deep stuff. I will say this, Forrest Whitaker in this and then also in uh, Rogue One, he's using accents. I don't know where they come from. He's becoming the Crispin Glover. He kind of uh, is. He's, he, gives his, he gives these bizarre performances. And, I, and, and I'm loving them, but I'm, I'm thinking, is that New Orleans by way of... Yorkshire? What ac- what accent is that? I don't understand. It's just there's these strange accents. Anyway, he's, he's awesome. really he's really going out on a limb these days, and I love it. But it's but it's he's kind of taken a, a weird turn as an actor. He's doing interesting accents. Never did that before. That's true. Uh, but Arrival is uh, just terrific. It's one fantastic. of the best films of the year, yeah. and uh, I think that it will hold up as being one of the 
not an A-level science right. fiction film, but a very solid, respected, lot remembered of, B-level science fiction film. Agreed. A lot of really, really interesting uh, extras on here. Uh, not a lot of extras, but but the ones that are here are interesting, uh, especially xenolinguistics, which gets into that whole area of study that a, uh, that uh, Amy Adams specializes in in the movie. And then, of course, the uh, you know the uh, the editing of the film and the sound design of the film. It's very interesting. I'm not sure it'll win. It, it, this is more likely to win sound editing than La La Land. But if La La Land wins sound editing, then it, it's all, all bets, bets are, are off. off. <laughs> he said it's the gonna, same thing. It's going to win like 12 awards. It, 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 it could be the all time top. Okay. I, I think it's going to win 10. To be honest. Okay. This this cannot I think it's win. win 10. It, it, it can't be the biggest. Like it's not that amazing. That's yeah, not going to be all time. Yeah, it is. The Oscar. The, Record holder for most wins ever. It could. It's not going. I don't think it's likely to. Uh, the three that it okay. It can only win thirteen of its fourteen because it's against its, itself in, in song. Um, and the three that I think it is unlikely to win is actor. It's not going to win actor. There's no chance. Uh, Gosling's not going to win actor. If Gosling wins actor, it's, it's, it's the people are. First of all, he doesn't deserve. It. First, he was the weak link in that movie. If you ask me, but he's the weak link. But he's the one that got her attached. And he sort of defers to her in the movie, which he should, which he should, because he can't sing, and can't dance. Well, he won't stop it. He's uh, he's not going to win. Uh, I think costume is a long shot. That almost always goes to period films. Just making dresses that are nice, bright, pretty colors. Of course, it's and uh, lots of buttons. It's not gonna. It's not that. That's not gonna cut it. I mean, it's got some great costumes. Don't get me wrong, but it's not. It's not. You know, Florence Foster Jenkins is. That's a that's a costuming effort. So I think I think they will more likely do that. And then sound editing and sound uh, are the other two. Well, ringers. the two sounds usually go together. They well, but they, yeah, they they've been split in recent years very often. And in this case, I think it's very likely to get sound because it is a musical and it's a really good sound effort. And because it's the first time that an all women, uh, an all female sound team has been Oscar nominated, and one of them is from Singapore, I think that just you know is is one of those stories, those backstories that's going to push people emotionally over the edge. Uh, sound editing, I'm not sure. It, uh, I'm not sure. So if it wins both of those, uh, you know, it's 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 a route. I want to see it win everything, but 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 best actor, because I want Gosling to realize, you know what? I'm just this depressed yeah. hangdog guy, who uh, you know I don't deserve to win. Anyway, <clears throat> okay, wait. Let's let's talk about two other uh, best picture nominees, yeah. shall we? Or should we yeah. wait on that? No, go ahead. <clears throat> so I remember popping in Hacksaw Ridge, and I thought to myself, oh, do I have to watch this with Mel Sugar Tit Gibson? <laughs> <laughs> who's been in movie jail for like 10 years because he's unhinged and out of his mind and God knows what the hell this guy thinks and his freaking dad, is he's out of his mind. <laughs> Mel Gibson like does not deserve to be in like the company of men when he thinks things like that. And then you watch the film, you're like, this guy's a good director. <laughs> <laughs> this guy could put, could put together a movie. And you're like, God damn, uh, XR Reach is really good. You know, see, I've been more forgiving of Mel than others because I just, I just, I, I have sympathy for the mentally ill, uh, and I say that <laughs> no, and I say that seriously. I think, I think, I think Mel has, you know, he's he's had that Jekyll and Hyde thing for many, many years, and uh, people have said that there's an evil Mel and there's a good Mel, and just hope he hasn't been drinking, and um, so I think that's. I, I I think that's always been part of who he is, and I'm willing to be a little bit forgiving, you know, because I've seen the uh, the, the cartoons where, you know, the Bugs Bunny cartoons, the Jekyll and Hyde things where you take the – never mind. Um. So anyway, <clears throat> that said, I didn't like Hacksaw Ridge. No. No. I thought it was too much. It was it was excess. It just – it was – It's very it, violent. It's all shot in Australia, and obviously so, with an all-Australian cast, all of them doing Virginia accents, well, except for Vince Vaughn. And uh, and, oh, and, like and, and Andrew Garfield, but Andrew Garfield is British, and he's doing a, a Virginia accent. And then you've got you know well because Ray- Mel realizes that he's got to surround himself with friendly with well, friendly faces they, they got, because he money. is Mel Gibson. They, they, they threw the money. Australia cut him a break, and they saved millions of dollars. But Rachel Griffiths, who I loved, is in it, and I know she's not an American, and. You know, this film almost Hugo makes Weaving is it? I just Sam like I, I was just. It's all. It's, it's I all was just, just very aware. Everyone in this movie is Australian. So what? Super, playing Americans. So what? Superman was played by a Brit, and Spider Man was played by a Brit. Andrew Garfield, right? Yeah. I mean, anyway. the, nowadays we're just used to that. Just look. Just just be glad that Andrew Garfield's role was not played by someone in China, so that they can release I, the film in China. Andrew Garfield made two movies about uh, men of faith uh, in struggles this season: Hacksaw Ridge and Silence for Scorsese. And in both of them, I found his hair to be much more dramatic than the movies. You're out of your mind. I think this thing is really well Andrew put Andrew Garfield's got a lot of hair. That's fine. Fair enough. 
Anyway, it's, got, it's a good Blu-ray. It's yeah. uh, two discs. It's a, a disc one, 4K Ultra HD. It looks fantastic. The Blu-ray uh, on disc two. Also, you got deleted scenes. You got uh, this thing with Mel Gibson that doesn't go anywhere. And you've got a uh, documentary making up, which is, you know, it, it's, it's a big wet kiss to the film, but it's worth skimming through. So I like Hacksaw Ridge a lot. I think this thing is just filled with just muscle and testosterone and blood and violence. And yet it tells – it's funny how Mel wants it both ways. He wants to tell – a story about about the importance of pacifism, using as much blood as he possibly can. Uh, it's it, that that's true, and that uh, you know I don't, I just I, it's excess. It's just so in your face. It's so slathers it on. Yeah, but I, that's Mel. Look at look look at like Apocalypto and 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 and, and Jesus and the Passion of the Christ for crying out loud. Yeah. Seriously, j- no character has ever been tortured as much in any seventeen films as Jesus was in that film. Manchester yeah. by the Sea. Wait, can I tell you something about Manchester by the Sea? Yeah, it's depressing. It is. <laughs> you know, I, I here's the thing. I'm 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 going to say this because I think I I think I'm I'm dead inside. I am dead inside because I did not freak out over Moonlight and I did not freak out over Manchester. I by didn't the sea. either. And and we had this conversation you like yesterday. Moonlight. No, I like Moonlight. I like Manchester by the Sea, but I I think they're both just shy of of. I, there are only three films I truly loved this last year, which was La La Land, Sing Street, and uh, The Innocents. Those are the three that are right at, right at the top of my list. Um, but uh, I, I will say this: Yesterday, it was a big love fest for Moonlight with uh, at the at the Oscar preview show, and um, Charles Solomon talking about Manchester was very funny. Charles said, "He said, you know, watching Manchester by the Sea, I need to have a bottle next to me." <laughs> and I just, and it was just huge laughter, and I just thought that's the perfect description <laughs> because it's so depressing. Kenneth Lonergan just really just my gosh, he makes it downbeat, but. It's a great movie. It's really good. It's a really great it, movie. You know what? It is. Why did it not? Here's the thing. Why did it not give me that emotional knockout punch that I felt I needed? Why was it just about a depressed guy moping I, around? I think it's because Lonergan does two things. Number, well, because Lonergan does a thing, and because you do another thing. This is why, and I have a theory about this. So. I think the fr- the thing that you do is you say this is getting really dark. I need to pull myself back. And as a viewer, you don't let yourself go as deep as he's trying to pull you. You 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 pull your you you, you say I got to come back a little bit. So you you throw up a wall, and that blunts the the impact. Uh, because the movies that really get you to a dark place and make it effective, they don't sort of gradually take you there and wallow in it. They throw you there very quickly with kind of a, a surprise. There's a moment where it jerks you and it jars you because otherwise you're going to resist it. Uh, and he takes you there pretty much immediately, and you know it's coming, and you feel that it's coming. And the other thing is he's a very subtle filmmaker. So he, even though he takes you there immediately, he doesn't do what Mel would do and lay, lay it on you know, super thick with a trowel. So I think he gives you a lot of fair warning. He does it slowly and methodically, and because he's that kind of filmmaker, you resist a little bit. That said, I don't think that's a flaw in the film. I just think that's the style of the film. So I think he otherwise does a – I think it's a really – Casey Affleck is great in this movie. Oh, he is great. He's not going to win. Um, he, he should win. Well, uh, Ryan Gosling's not going to win. No, no, no. I think Denzel's going to win. I really? Mean, yeah, I do. I wow. do. Because, because Casey got tainted by that whole – um, you I know. feel like that's kind of defeating now. It's not. It's, he, not, it's not like the Red we'll Nation see. guy. It's not. It, it. But we'll see. I feel it, like that. That's not getting any traction. I. I would have said that before the uh, the SAG Awards. The fact that Denzel won the SAG Award, which is granted much more of a popularity contest than the Oscars. You know, uh, it's much more star centric at the at the at the SAGs. But that makes me feel as though the momentum has shifted to Denzel. And this would not be the first time that Denzel is the beneficiary of someone else's behavior. You know, he's a good citizen. Denzel is everybody's favorite guy. He's stalwart. He's squeaky clean. He's a family man. The whole thing, right? I mean, we love Denzel. He's a dad. He's a husband. He's got gr- great kids. His dad was a preacher. You know, he's the guy. He's our, he's our Hollywood model, our icon, right? We love him. He's everything that a movie star is supposed to be. Um, and uh, he wasn't going to win in, in 2001 either, if you remember. But then Russell Crowe went and threw a phone at somebody, and everybody's like, okay, Denzel it is. Uh, and, and so, you know, just being well-behaved wins you a lot of traction. And let's face it, Fences is a hell of a film. 
Yeah. It really is. He did a great job. He took a very, very difficult play, reinterpreted it in, a, in, a, in an interesting but very faithful way, and uh, it's a terrific movie. So I think an, an Oscar for him there honors him both as an actor and a director and as a producer, frankly. So Yeah, Fences is interesting. People complain that, you know, he, he didn't... He didn't expand the story beyond what it was. He yeah. didn't use different locations. But you know but, what? But but there are certain plays you can't and, and that you shouldn't. And it's like Death of a Salesman is the same thing. Fences is very much a kind of almost a flip side companion piece, cross-cultural version of Death of a Salesman. You know, those two guys sort of represent two very different kinds of American fathers. You know, one black, one white, but basically coming from the same sort of cultural and and uh, same era, the same general milieu. And uh, I, I think you treat those things much more preciously than than you would, you know, another play where you like like Moonlight, where you can sort of freely adapt it because it's not this it doesn't have this cultural gravitas to it. Something else, too, is that, you know, I'm sure Denzel, who's done the play and he's done many plays he probably thinks to himself, look, yes, the play is revered, and it's won every award that there is, but let's face it, only, you know, 0.005% of the world has ever seen this play. Yes. So True. why am I going to take it and send it to different locations and different cities and different countries and bars and restaurants and all this sort of crap when the fact is, is that very, very few people have ever experienced this play? So I'm going to – Expand it instead of having it just be indoors. I'll have it in the house, so it's yeah. in the house. It's it's outside the house in the backyard, and maybe there's a couple of exteriors with the garbage truck, whatever. But that's basically it, because he's trying to honor the play and not True put that. too many of his fingerprints on it. Because the thing is perfect as well, it is. That, that's going to come out in a few weeks on uh, on Blu-ray as well. So we'll we'll cover it more at that time. So Justin Kelly, interesting director, uh, first time filmmaker a couple of years ago with a movie called I Am Michael, which was a kind of a biopic of uh, Michael Glatzy. Uh, who was the uh, a, a, um, a gay rights activist who became straight and evangelical and has remained a, a very controversial figure. Um, that was a really interesting movie. James Franco did a great job in that lead performance. Very impressive. But that was not the first of Justin Kelly's films released. His second film was released first and by a more mainstream distributor. Uh, IFC Midnight released King Cobra, which is a terrible movie, and that's what I don't understand. Justin Kelly needs to return to what he did in I Am Michael and make more interesting character studies. Uh, King Cobra is based on a, um, a murder that took place in the gay porn world, and uh, the movie kind of... James Franco's in this again. He's not the main star. Uh, Garrett Clayton is the star. Christian Slater <clears throat> plays the producer who makes him into a porn star, and then everything goes south from there. Um, Alicia Silverstone and Molly Ringwald even have brief appearances in this. It, it, it's just it's not it's not an interesting film, and it it, it just doesn't uh, it's not as subtle, it's not as nuanced, it's not as sort of compelling, and it just wallows in in a world which is really uh, tangential for most people. I mean, gay porn. How much interest is there really in a mainstream non-gay porn film about the gay porn world? I am I would, so into that. Yeah, I don't think you are. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, just a few other uh, quick ones here. Uh, oh, that's a good one. I forgot we had that this week. Uh, so uh, Somewhere in the Middle uh, by a filmmaker named Lanre Olabisi. Um, this is an okay film. You know, there's uh, most of these independent films that, that have all non-white casts, some of them, you know, uh, mixed race. This one is an all-black cast. Um, they, they tend to sort of try to uh, you know, flaunt that a little bit too much, saying, look, you know, we are, uh, we're a film for the quote-unquote the community. Um, this one doesn't do that. And that I and I appreciate that it is it is low budget. It is uh, you know an interesting it is an interesting study of human relationships, which of course we've seen trillions of times in movies. But um, it's uh, it, you know great New York locations and backdrop, good solid New York cast, and I think uh, somewhere in the middle is a is a solid little uh, indie. Uh, kind of in a sort of similar vein is uh, the Free World. Um, this was a Sundance entry, has a great performance by Octavia Spencer, who I think is actually better in this than she is in, uh, uh, in Hidden Figures, which is very, very commercial and mainstream, and I don't fault it for that, it's just not as interesting. Uh, written and directed by Jason, uh, Justin Liu, J uh, no, Jason Liu, 
And um, this is a uh, this is a good solid drama. Uh, I'm sure as as uh, Jason Liu becomes more of a major filmmaker, I will um, probably know him more. Um, not that uh, this is his debut film, and uh, it's it's really uh, the acting is what makes this. It's entirely about acting, uh, basically dealing with um, you know someone who is in jail for a crime that he did not commit. And uh, what it's like coming out and having to uh, sort of adjust your life to that. And then it's also about the prisons that we make when we're not in prison. The, the relationships, the choices, the way that we can turn our life into a prison. It's a, very, it's a very salient little kind of movie with a bit of a theatrical quality to it. Uh, London Town with Jonathan Rhys Myers um, didn't really do much for me. I love Jonathan Rhys Myers, but I feel like sometimes he's just trying to be a little bit too alternative in his movies. Uh, this reminded me a little bit of Velvet Goldmine, where he was sort of a David Bowie-esque figure, and this takes place in the 1970s, deals with punk, the punk scene, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, I guess there's a movie to be done where you sort of wallow in in the in the, the origins of punk, I look. The Clash is the backdrop to this film, and Jonathan Rhys Myers plays Joe Strummer. All I could think was, I'm watching Jonathan Rhys Myers because I know who Joe Strummer is. I know what he looks like. I know what he sounds like. And Jonathan Rhys Myers could be the best actor in history. He's never going to convince me he's Joe Strummer. So there's my hurdle. Um, and then lastly here, before I unleash Mark on a few other interesting movies, uh, Michel Vinick made a movie called Blush. Don't know who Michel Vinick is, uh, but the film is not bad. Uh, this was an entry in uh, Outfest in 2016. Um, it basically takes place in, uh, in Tel Aviv, and it's, uh, it is a, it is a you know, lesbian love story. Uh, but it uh, it's got a, it's got you know a little bit of an edge and a little bit of an angle to it and uh, yeah the you know the the Tel Aviv Israeli Jewish thing does give it a a, a different quality um, it's just good performances uh, not really uh, not really anything particularly special in terms of uh, story or, or execution but it uh, it certainly does uh, it does have a different uh, a different vibe so that's an interesting entry this week as well it's called Blush and that's from a film movement. Um, all right, Mark. Mark just evacuated his space uh, evacuated to what? your what? space, your chair. Yes, I want to oh yeah, okay, okay. All right, okay. Fair enough. Mark wants to. Uh, Mark wanted to watch the uh, the sixty frame per second Billy Lynn's halftime walk. So while Mark's doing that, uh, I will mention a couple of other films real quickly. Uh, Alfred Woodard is the best thing in Knucklehead, uh, another independent film. This one is from uh, RLJ Entertainment, and it is uh, a, about a, uh, a a young man uh, who is mentally disabled and uh, it basically finds himself alone in the Brooklyn housing project when he where he normally lives with his brother, but his brother is gone, and uh, all and he the only other person the only other family he has is a uh, is Alfred Woodard who plays an absolutely horrible horrible mother. And um, it is uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a little bit of a it's a little cloying it's a little obvious the way that it um, plays that angle. Anytime you have the I am Sam kind of uh, thing with with some kind of a, a, an emotional or a mental handicap, it, you you feel like the director and the or the writer uh, in this case both of them Ben Bowman co wrote and directed. They're pulling your strings. They're pulling your chain a little bit. They're going for a little bit of the obvious uh, heartstrings. That said, it's awfully, awfully hard to dismiss a movie that has Alfre Woodard in it. Uh, she is such an accomplished actress. She makes such interesting choices, and she grounds it so firmly, uh, much as she does Luke Cage, for that matter, uh, that you, you just can't really dismiss it. So that, that's a – I'm going to recommend Knucklehead. I think there's a lot of uh, – it, it, it sidesteps all of its pitfalls pretty well. Uh, the Alchemist Cookbook – uh, by Joel uh, Potricus, I guess is, is his name, Potricus, um, is uh, not as not as freaky as I wanted it to be. This is from Oscilloscope. It's Blu-ray. Uh, he's an inter- Potricus is an interesting director. I think his future is is bright. But um, the whole idea here of a guy who sort of lives in a trailer in the woods and is doing you know sort of uh, witchcrafty things. 
really should be creepy you know on a level that this film isn't um but that said it's got some interesting uh insights as, into why they made the film and how they did it uh with potricus and ty hickson his actor uh in a commentary which is very very good and very insightful and uh deleted scenes and um you know some uh outtakes and things like that so that's blu-ray and then um lastly here before i, I we find out what mark thought of billy lynn's halftime walk is a movie that I absolutely loved and nobody else seemed to have loved, and I don't care. A uh, filmmaker named Rosemary Myers made a movie called Girl Asleep. I think Girl Asleep is an absolutely awesome, totally sweet movie. This is an Australian film, and uh, it is... I, I'm trying to think of how to even describe this. It's like... It, there's a very Wes Anderson-y, David Lynch-y mashup kind of sensibility to this thing. And uh, it, it's a coming-of-age movie about a young girl in the 1970s who, who is going to have a 15th birthday party, and her parents really want to make it matter. But there's a whole strange breaching of reality thing and creatures in the woods and weird dreams, and it gets super surreal. It, it's just I just find this film so charming and so cool and so weird and so entertaining – and it has a dance sequence that I just laughed myself delirious. Uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. So, Girl Asleep on Blu-ray. It's a weird, twisted, strange, charming movie. But it's very smart and really well done. And I think Rosemary Myers is a director to watch. So, that's from Oscilloscope on Blu-ray. All right. Uh, so, Mark, let's discuss Billy Lynn's Halftime Walk. Um, I think Billy Lynn's Halftime Walk needs to be watched on Blu-ray. Yeah. If you watch it in ultra... 4K Ultra HD with the 60 frames a second. You're going to be taken out of the movie. You're going to be, this is freaky. It's the same thing. Remember when people bought all those widescreen TVs and they put it on that yeah. 120 hertz setting that made everything look uh, like yeah. video, like a telenovela? Yeah. And it, just, it was a horrible way to watch any film ever? Yeah. This is a little like that. So what I would say is if you really want to consider the film as a, as a, as a piece of storytelling – Watch the Blu-ray. Don't watch the uh, 4K. Because if you do watch the, the Blu-ray, you'll realize that the film really is not as bad as his reputation. Yes. Well, here's the thing about Billy Lynn's hat, long halftime walk. And I'm kind of, you know, I, I admire that Ang Lee wants to keep pushing the envelope and do new things. I get it. He's, you know, Peter Jackson and James Cameron. Uh, they're, they're all trying to do new things. Vim Vendor's a little bit too. Uh, but at a certain point, just tell me a story, please. I love Ang Lee. I want him to do more films that are just good stories. And this is not necessarily one of them. Uh, speaking of war movies, we're talking about Mel Gibson and Hacksaw Ridge. I this I, I don't know, man. It it the you know the the Hobbit was shot. Uh, what was it? It was it was all was Hobbit also sixty frames a second? I can't remember. Yeah, which it was at the time. Yeah, and that just uh, you know didn't really work. Uh, so in any case, uh, Billy Lynn's long halftime walk was considered a big Oscar front runner until it's uh, unspooled at uh, Toronto. And then people just said, yeah, not so much. And it completely fell out of the awards talk and, of course, got no, no nominations because nobody went to see it. And they didn't even send us screeners, nothing. Um, what I find interesting here is this is a, a 4K Ultra HD along with a Blu-ray along with a Blu-ray 3D. Now, everybody knows Ang Lee, Life of Pi, Best Director, 3D Movie. I love we, that we film. Get, uh, yeah, not so much. But anyway, what's interesting is there's no 4K Blu-ray it's 4K or blue. Uh, I'm sorry. There's no 4K 3D. It's either 4K or 3D Blu-ray in just regular HD. So we all know now that since CES, there are no more new 3D TVs. It's dead. 3D is a dead format. If you have a 3D television and you like 3D, hang on to it because you ain't going to replace it. It's never coming back. That's going to be you know a, a rare thing now. So. Um, the the issue then is which is the better format to watch this in, 4K or Blu-ray 3D? I'm just going to say regular Blu-ray. Regular Blu-ray, not 3D, not 60 frames a second. Watch this thing, just regular Blu-ray, and you'll be fine. Anyway, uh, yeah, Billy Lynn's half, long halftime walk. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate. This was a bit, bit of a big deal as a book, wasn't it? It was a big deal as a book, and it was yeah. a big deal that Ang Lee, Ang Lee was going to do it. Yeah, too bad. Anyway, well... You know, I mean, it's the story of a guy, you know, in uh, fighting in Iraq, you know. But, I mean, it just, I, I don't, I didn't even think the war scenes were that rousing, to be honest. Uh, you know what is rousing, Wade? 
Huh. Edge of Seventeen. I love this movie. Hilarious. I so love it. I love her. I love everything about this movie. I love. I love Woody Harrelson. How funny are the scenes with her and Woody Harrelson? Yeah, this is like this is priceless. Like, they are priceless. This is like what uh, John Hughes would have made this. Now this is like Sixteen Candles for a new generation. Uh, I, I Helly Steinfeld, yeah. who She's I great. just I love her. I loved her in True Grit. I was like, who is this girl? I was so yep. happy that she was yep. nominated for an Oscar for that. Yep. And uh, she's only getting better and better, and this film is just too damn funny. It's been a while since we, you know, it's funny too because like now, you know, kids that age they traffic in irony, and 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 they're not. They sometimes they come across as not being sincere or really going through um, um, emotions in, in adult ways, mainly because yeah. they're, mainly because they're not adults. Yep. But here's a film that has the comedy and has the irony and has the sarcasm, but the emotions are still real. Yeah, that's true. So it's okay. Absolutely true. Love you know? it. Love so everything about it. Most of these films just have the irony and the sarcasm. Yep. This one is great. I think this thing is uh, uh, highly recommended, even if you are not 17. Yes. Or if even if you are not 34, which is two times 17. Yeah. Or even if you are not. Yeah. What 17 times three? 51. So, 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 yeah, yeah. Yes. Even if you're not 51. <laughs> even if you're not 68. You should even watch if, this Even film. if you're not 102. <laughs> is that right? Anyway, th- this film is just terrific. I yeah, really, really love it a lot. Uh, what I didn't love a lot was Bad Santa too. I love Bad Santa. We all love Bad Santa. Bad Santa, cult classic. Everyone loves Bad Santa. You know, somebody should make a study in terms of the, the longer it takes to make the sequel, how good that sequel is. Right? Especially if you're making a sequel to a film. There's, that a, there's a window. If you, if you miss the window, don't make a sequel. And they missed the window with this. They missed the window. They, the window was two years. You come out with Bad Santa 2 within two years of Bad Santa. If you can't come out with one in within two years, you're done. Don't, also, don't even bother. Much, much like Bad News Bears, you can't make that sequel be no. like the original. No. Okay? The, the, the studio is not going to say, yes, I want you to make a sequel called Bad Santa 2 that is just as profane and hateful as the original Bad Santa. No, no. This one has to uh, be better. This one has to appeal to more people. We, we our quarterly profit earnings are coming up. We can't so afford upsetting. this anymore. So now they make a bad Santa too. That's you know, it's 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 out there, but it's not bad Santa. No. The inspiration was for one ninety-minute film, and then the inspiration was gone. Anything else just seems too mercenary, uh-huh. and that's the problem with bad Santa too. I agree, completely. And uh, as we uh, close in on the end of the show, uh, Steven Seagal has another movie. That's it. Done. I do I even need to do the main? Oh, God. He's the best. It's called End of a Gun, Where Justice Prevails. How many? <laughs> I. Who, who comes up with these titles? End of okay. a Gun. I want to ask you. Mark, look. I just want you to look at the artwork on the box. Uh-huh. The cover on the back. Mm-hmm. That is not his natural hair color. No, it's not. Oh, well, I, I guarantee the back is what he really looks that's, like. He's old and paunchy. That's and... not even. Not only is that not his natural hair color. That's not even a natural color anywhere in nature. He he will do What is that? He will do any film the, anywhere that 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 matches his rate, which is to say what he thinks he deserves. I know, but that's that's not even that's that the color of his hair and his and his goatee by the way, which is the same color. That isn't even a dye. That's like tar. What is that? I that's mean, that's like that's like so black that it, that it it, it it would even a black hole wouldn't want anything to do with it. What is that? He, you know what? He's sixty four years old, right? Oh. And the thing is that the more he he, he punches out, the more he, oh. and, and dyes his hair, the bigger of a joke he becomes. It's crazy. He shoots people. It's uh, you know it's set in Paris, and uh, he, he's paunchy. And I just I it, it's it's so not good. Uh, but this comes to us from Grindstone Entertainment. And Grindstone is one of those AFM companies, those American film market companies that just you know they just crank them out. You know, it's just, amazing. They and just I'm... get they get has been stars and and wannabe stars and almost so, stars, okay. and they put them into action films, and they just they just. Crank him out. So Charles Bronson yes. was born in 1921. He was another one. No, hang on. Charles Bronson was born in 1921. Yeah. Charles Bronson did Death Wish in 1974. That means that Charles Bronson was 53 years old. In Death Wish. In Death Wish. Yeah. And you looked at that guy and you said, you said that. Yeah, well, yeah, but that's Bronson. But Bronson's a real actor. He is a real actor. But he also, yeah. he also stayed in shape. Yes, true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if, if, if Steven Seagal aged a little more realistically yeah. and maybe dropped 100 pounds, <laughs> you'd be like, all right, you know, he's doing a thing. Yeah, all right. Just stay in shape. End of a gun where justice prevails. I just, End of I a can't career. Even, I can't even. All right. 
So with that, Mark, good to have you back. Yay. And, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, our next show is likely to be recorded before the Oscars. So we will uh, we will not have our, our Oscar uh, postmortem at that time, but uh, the following week we will. So uh, next show, no Oscars, but the show after that, we will give you our full, complete postmortem and scoop on our opinions of uh, what the Academy Awards delivered. With that, we'll see you next week. 